Good afternoon. Thank you for attending my talk today and, and uh, welcome back to Virtual AACR. It's great to be here again in this format uh, to talk about cancer research. Before I get started, I would like to congratulate Dr. Doug Lowy on receiving AACR's Distinguished Public Service Award. I'd also like to congratulate NCI's Dr. Steve Rosenberg on receiving the AACR Cancer Research Institute Lloyd J. Old Award in Cancer Immunology. And I'd like to congratulate NCI's Dr. Patty Stieg for winning the ACR Women in Cancer Research Charlotte Friend Lectureship. I think this is evidence of the tremendous and deserving talent we have at the National Cancer Institute. So congratulations to those NCI recipients. The April ACR sessions were held entirely online. And this was a large undertaking, a significant shift in the perspective as we confronted the global pandemic. We adapted to social distancing, labs were shut down, clinical care was disrupted. And now, as we come together just eight weeks later, we do so amid profound upheaval of our nation. In times of crisis and struggle, we often cope by focusing on what's right in front of us, the next meeting, the next day, the next patient. It helps us to manage, it helps us manage to put one foot in front of the other. It's how we deal with our own uncertainty and anxiety. But in many ways, it also keeps us from recognizing the shortcomings of our world. It allows us to, uh, to just focus on the present and prevents us from acting together to address the suffering of others. This meeting, however, is an opportunity for us to step back and view our work from different angles and really consider what is going on. This is undoubtedly harder today than it was for say AACR 2019, but I think it is critical that we look to the future, the longer term. And that is a challenge that my colleagues at NCI and I keep coming back to to manage the formidable issues that we face each day, but to also keep an eye on the long future ahead. Not only to consider a time when the specific challenges of this week and this year are behind us, but to inform the decisions we make today and to factor into those decisions where we want to be. Where do we want future generations to be? We must ask ourselves in 2021 and beyond, how will we judge the actions that we're taking today? Did they make a difference and have we done enough? So today, I will, of course, describe the work of the NCI during unusual times. I plan to make some remarks about NCI's efforts to address racial inequality in cancer research. I will briefly touch on our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I will also highlight some real research progress that we are making. And then I'll take some questions. The recent deaths and brutal treatment of George Floyd and other African Americans at the hand of police officers have horrified the national con conscience. As individuals, these events have forced us to reckon with the painful truths on many levels. With regard to our mission to address cancer suffering, these ob obvious demonstrations of persistent racial inequality in American life force us to consider our own efforts in this regard and our obligations to work for positive change. Because it is clear that however noble our aims have been to date, these results remain woefully insufficient. I'm not saying that cancer research and cancer care by themselves uh, can solve a tremendous societal problem like racial injustice, but we must take a clear-eyed look at our field and our own efforts and commit to taking actions to make things better. One of the 20th century's greatest writers, uh, James Baldwin, expressed this sentiment more eloquently than I have. He said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. That's why, I want, <clears throat> that's why I want you to know that my remarks here today reflect ongoing efforts. And even though efforts in some places do show some encouraging developments, we're, we are well aware there is still a long way to go. I plan to spend much of my time in the days and weeks ahead, making sure that the decisions we make today at the NCI will bear fruit, and yes, they'll make a positive difference. Although there are many ways in which the NCI is working to counter racial injustice, in my limited time today, I thought I would touch on two in particular. The first area is diversity in the workforce. I believe that having a diverse group of cancer scientists and cancer caregivers is good for society in many ways. It's more equitable, it's better for patients, and it's better for science. I believe in diversity across the healthcare spectrum, from administrators to cancer researchers to physicians and nurses and other caregivers. And creating a diverse workforce for cancer research is really the work of the NCI. It is one of our main jobs and one of our main missions. Diversity makes us stronger because we need different ideas, different points of view, and different approaches, because it makes science more equitable, because we owe it to our diverse patient population. And I am committed to working hard 
to create a diverse workforce for cancer research at NCI and across the grantee community, not only because it is part of our work, but because it is our responsibility. It will make the entire enterprise of cancer research much stronger. So how are we doing in that regard? Well, frankly, not as well as we would like. Here are two recent publications that address funding rates for African-American and other minority scientists, and they paint a concerning picture. Even after accounting for many variables like type of training, year of degree, research area being studied, et cetera, the data show that underrepresented minority scientists do less well in peer review. The causes of this are in no doubt multifactorial, and they have, been, they have proven difficult to address. And funding rates, as everybody at AACR knows, are really important. NIH funding is key to the perception of academic success. It is critical to promotion and tenure. It is the lifeblood of a large independent research enterprise. So if we don't fix this, we will continue to miss out on the creative genius of underrepresented minority scientists. And our progress against cancer will be slower than it could have been, and it will be denied to many. So what can we do? Even if we all agree this is a problem we'd really like to fix, how do we do that, especially given the, the world we live in with constrained resources? There are actually several things one could try, but the relative merits of many of these approaches have not been determined. One key way to address funding disparities being implemented by the NCI is what I would call the pipeline approach. This approach seeks to identify really talented, underrepresented minority would-be scientists early on in their career and then invest in them. Invest in them through funding, but also through mentoring and extra training, and by helping these individuals find a network of other scientists to give them advice and help. At the National Cancer Institute, this program is called the CURE program, shown here. There is also a related program for intramural scientists at the NIH called iCURE. This program is 20 years old, and under Sonia Springfield's leadership in the National Cancer Institute Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities, it has supported thousands of diverse trainees through a variety of mechanisms through the years. Much of the work of the CURE program focuses at the grad school or postdoc level, but the program makes significant efforts to identify potential students very early, really starting even at the high school or even middle school level, and then going all the way to the first faculty appointment. And we have, abs we have evidence that participation in CURE makes a difference. CRCHD has completed an analysis that shows that alumni of the CURE program are significantly more likely to receive R01 funding as faculty than matched non-participating scientists. Put another way, participation in CURE appears to largely, if not entirely, remove the funding disparity for underrepresented minority scientists. This is pretty exciting, right? I believe this suggests the NCI has identified at least one approach that has some success, it has some merit. But I will admit that this alone is not enough and that we need to do more. For those of you who are underrepresented minority scientists or who mentor underrepresented minority scientists, I hope you will learn more about the CURE program and other NCI initiatives in this regard. And AACR is providing a prime opportunity for this as CRCHD's Tiffany Wallace will be speaking about the CURE program on Wednesday. And I think you should check it out if interested. So that's a topic related to disparities affecting training and funding. I'd like to now turn to another area of importance to the NCI, and that's clinical research on disparities in health outcomes. The NCI funds a tremendous amount of work to address cancer health disparities. This portfolio is much too large to completely cover today, but it is a really strong collection of efforts in disparities research. And in fact, I would argue the National Cancer Institute really leads all of biomedical research with our support for work seeking to understand and eliminate healthcare disparities. And in this regard, the NCI has learned that understanding which patients are accrued to clinical trials is a really important metric to follow. In particular, the accrual of underrepresented minority patients to clinical trials is critical for a few reasons. It is vitally important to make sure that new approaches to therapy are tested in representative populations. We know there are important racial and ethnic differences in how patients respond to certain therapies, and therefore diversity in accrual assures that the study's results are more generalizable. But I would argue, perhaps even more important than that, is that we've come to understand that access to trials is a proxy for good care. This notion comes from some terrific work from the NCI-supported Southwest Oncology Group, or SWOG, as well as other groups, and demonstrates that access to clinical trials is a key feature of good cancer care. 
So if underrepresented minority patients aren't going on clinical trials, to me, this is a sign that something is wrong within the engine of clinical cancer research. And I don't have to tell those of you in clinical research that this is a hard problem with multifactorial, multifactorial causes. When I was at the FDA, we spent a lot of time addressing this across all disease areas beyond cancer. And trust me, minority accrual has proven to be a hard problem for all of the biomedical research for both industry and for the NIH. I'd like to show you some data on how the NCI is doing in this regard. Shown are the accrual rates for NCI-supported phase one to phase three trials. This analysis provided by NCI's Warder McCaskill Stevens in the Division of Cancer Prevention shows an increase in minority accrual from 1999 to now. There is some good news here. Minority accrual over this period has steadily increased, now to 27% of NCI phase, th phase three trials done through NCTN and NCORE. How has the NCI accomplished this? One important feature has been the use of minority and underserved designated sites in the NCTN and NCORE. Not surprisingly, sites that do a good job of care for underrepresented minority patients also do a good job of putting their patients on clinical trials. So I think this has to be acknowledged as real and substantial progress against what has proven to be a very hard problem. But I think it is equally important to acknowledge that there is still progress yet to be made. For example, the data show that so far, we have been more successful in increasing clinical trials participation for Hispanic patients than we have been for African Americans. I find this somewhat surprising, and we are working diligently to try to understand the explanation for this trend and to see how we can improve it. And before I leave the topic of addressing racial and ethnic disparities in cancer research and cancer outcomes, I have to mention the Minorities in Cancer Research Program. This marvelous collaboration between NCI and AACR is in its 20th year. It includes 4,000 members and has supported hundreds of faculty, postdocs, and students. I have always very much enjoyed the MICR events at AACR, having attended three such events in the past, and I was very much looking forward to the big party this year for the 20th anniversary. But sadly, that is not happening this year unless we do it by Zoom chat due to current travel circumstances. So we will have to postpone that celebration in real life at least. Perhaps we can do this at AACR's 13th annual conference on cancer health disparities this October in Miami. Perhaps in real life, we'll see. So this has been a brief summary of a few of the ways that NCI is working to address racial and ethnic disparities in cancer research and cancer care. We have more ideas in the works, some in partnership with other agencies and some in partnership with the NIH and I look forward to talking about these exciting developments as they mature. Suffice it to say, we are committed to making progress against these hard and pernicious problems because NCI has a moral obligation to, take, to make progress in these important areas. And oh yeah, there's still a global pandemic going on. NCI's response to the COVID-19 outbreak has been rapid, impressive, and nimble and deep. Our primary concern is of course, the health and safety of people with cancer healthcare providers, and NCI grantees and staff. And, and we are fortunate and proud to be able to contribute our expertise and infrastructure to critical research on COVID-19, separate from our work in cancer. Here's a list of some of the activities, as well as a link to provide further information on these items. I won't have time to cover all of these things that we're doing today, but I wanted to mention a few very recent developments. First, on April 24th, the National Cancer Institute received a large supplemental appropriation for research of COVID serology and related technologies. This congressional funding reflects NCI's tremendous expertise in virology in general and in serologic research in particular. We started this effort working at our top-notch serology lab at Frederick National Lab, where we've developed assays and reagents and performed a really exciting interagency collaboration with the FDA on this topic. More recently, we have begun to move a lot of these activities extramurally where there is significant additional research expertise and capacity. In this regard, working with NIAD, we recently published two new funding announcements that will create CeroNet, a research network for serology research. The, the, uh, to meet the urgent need of the pandemic, these open RFAs were developed in record time for the National Cancer Institute and will close on July 22nd. Given the strong expertise in immunology and serology among the AACR membership, I thought these very new funding opportunities would be of interest. Another interesting area relates to our work to better understand COVID pathogenesis. 
NCI scientists Wynn Wilson and Lou Stout reasoned that an overly exuberant immune response might contribute to poor outcome in severe COVID-19. Several in investigators have postulated such a mechanism, and this is the basis for a large number of ongoing trials of immunomodulatory agents in COVID-19, including the recently reported dexamethasone result in the UK recovery trial. Lou and Wyndham had the idea that BTK signaling, possibly within macrophages, might contribute to pathogenic lung inflammation and cytokine release in some critically ill patients. In a prospective off-label clinical study in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, they tested the BTK inhibitor acalabrutinib, which as many of you know is approved for treatment of CLL. In the majority of treated patients, inflammation reversed rapidly and lung function improved. This was accompanied by a rapid improvement in oxygenation and lymphocyte count in many patients, enabling several of these patients to return home. Though it's too early to say whether blocking BTK will work and more will work more broadly in patients with severe COVID-19, these results have been uh, have led to a large randomized control trial of a calibrutinib for severe COVID-19. I would also like to talk about our recently opened natural history trial called NCAPS that will answer key questions about COVID-19's impact on cancer patients, as well as cancer's impact on the course of COVID-19. We plan to enroll 2,000 patients at more than 1,000 sites across the United States, and we strongly encourage any and all NCI-funded clinical trial sites to participate, especially those sites reaching minority, underserved, and rural populations, and sites in law areas with a high prevalence of COVID-19. Uh, patients provide informed consent to participate, and the trial includes longitudinal collection of samples and data, including imaging results. There will be a robust analysis of serum biomarkers in order to identify predictors of outcome in these patients, as well as analysis of germline genetics. We started planning this trial in mid-March and already have it written, approved by Central IRB, and now open and accruing at over 400 sites. I think at this, th this has to be some kind of record for a complex multi-institutional trial for things like this at the NCI. We believe the findings of this trial will influence the treatment of cancer patients with COVID-19 in the future. We have seen decades of great progress re with regard to national cancer mortality statistics, and no one wants to see that progress undermined. This slide shows what we should be worried about, the ways in which the global pandemic could disrupt cancer progress. There is the issue of delayed diagnosis because patients are less likely to see doctors for a new symptom or routine screening during the pandemic. There's the issue of deferred care because hospitals and clinics have stopped certain elective procedures like elective resections of tumors and elective chemotherapy. And they've done this to preserve hospital capacity during the pandemic. And then there's the issue of reduced and non-standard care during the pandemic for a variety of reasons. For example, some centers have been using neoadjuvant therapy to delay surgery for some patients diagnosed with cancer. And it's unclear how these non-standard regimens will affect outcomes. Because of these changes in care uh, that we find concerning, I asked NCI's CISNET network, working with extramural fundees to help try and model the impact of the pandemic on uh, cancer outcomes for the next decade. We chose to do this for breast and colorectal cancer, since these are common cancers with relatively high screening rates, and CISNET investigators have developed sophisticated and validated simulation models for these cancers already, and these models have been used to, for a link between complex evidence and for actionable public health strategies in the past. We made what I consider reasonable assumptions about the effect of COVID-19 on cancer screening and treatment and modeled the effects on mortality for these two cancers over the next decade. This analysis suggests that we will see almost 10,000 excess breast and colorectal cancer deaths over the next 10 years, which represents a roughly 1% increase in excess deaths from these two tumor types over that period. For both cancer types, we believe the pandemic will influence cancer deaths for at least a decade. I find this worrisome as cancer mortality is common. Even a 1% increase over a decade is a lot of cancer suffering. And this analysis is pretty conservative. We do not consider cancers other than those of the breast and colon, but there is every reason to believe the pandemic will affect other types of cancer too. We did not account for additional non-lethal morbidity from upstaging, but this could also be significant. And perhaps most crucially, the analysis we've done assumes only a moderate disruption in screening and care that completely resolves after six months. Obviously, if the pandemic disrupts routine care for a greater degree or for a longer period, the effect on cancer mortality could be even worse. 
I think this analysis begins to help us understand the costs with regard to cancer outcomes of the pandemic. Let's all agree as cancer researchers and cancer doctors and caregivers that we will do everything in our power to minimize these adverse effects on cancer outcomes and to protect our patients from cancer suffering. So as a community, I think I've summarized that we have a lot to work to do to combat, to combat racial inequality and to do what we can to mitigate the impacts of this pandemic on the people we serve. And I think part of how we will do this, as I said earlier, is by taking those immediate steps to manage the current landscape of our efforts and focus on the future. Now, I'd like to share with you a number of recent advances in cancer research and some exciting programs that are in development in the early stages. Selumetinib was approved in April, but this story has been 30 years in the making. It illustrates the importance and value of investments in basic research and the long-term support for ideas whose ultimate utility may be unclear at first. Selumetinib is used to treat neurofibromatosis. It started with NIH Director Francis Collins, first describing NF1 when he cloned that gene. Then Doug Lowy and others uh, figured out what it did from a biochemical standpoint. And this culminated in a pediatric oncology branch trial at the NCI, showing that selumetinib helps greatly improve the lives of patients with this difficult disease. It's an incredibly heartwarming story and a testament to the tenacity of those in the intro program, like Brigitte Wiedemann, who led many failed trials before this notable success. This is not a cure, but it is a huge improvement in the quality of life for these patients with a common congenital cancer predisposition syndrome. I take my hat off to all those involved in bringing this meaning, meaningful new therapy for kids. People who are over 50 who recently developed diabetes are at higher risk for being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer within three years of their new diagnosis of diabetes compared to uh, matched individuals without diabetes. NCI, in partnership with PANCAN and the National Institute of Diabetes and Di Digestive Kidney Diseases, or NIDDK, developed the new onset diabetes study a prospective cohort to follow individuals at higher risk for developing pancreatic cancer. This study will establish a biobank of clinically annotated specimens. It will facilitate validation of emerging tests for identifying NOD subjects at high risk for pancreatic cancer using the clinically annotated biospecimen reference set. And it will provide a platform for the future development of an early detection protocol for sporadic cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer in the new onset diabetes subjects. And this includes uh, using imaging and other clinical parameters. Before taking questions, I'd like to thank each of you and your, for your attention and thank AACR again for the opportunity to speak today. Before everything changed, I wrote and spoke a great deal about this incredibly exciting time in cancer research, how NCI is receiving R01 applications at an increasing and record pace, how we've had a record-breaking number of approvals for new cancer drugs and devices, and how there's tremendous enthusiasm for cancer research and real progress for our patients. Our reality today, frankly, may look, a little, may look a little different from those prior speeches, but I hope we can soon get back to that hopeful and innovative spirit that has allowed us to make such progress in the past. And the, the ingredients for such success are still all here. We have a creative and talented and resilient research workforce. We have promising directions and insights to exploit. And most importantly, we have patients and their loved ones who need us more than ever to apply our training and expertise and attention to cancer in order to develop better treatments, better ways to prevent and to, to diagnose cancer, better ways to help people live their lives after cancer, better ways for communities to provide high quality care to everyone with cancer. I will close with a quote from Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We have always held the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. I am confident we will have better days ahead, just beyond our present horizon. This year, 2020, will, do, will go down in the history books as one of the most consequential years ever for public health and for biomedical research, including cancer care and cancer research. We are all busy meeting the challenges of today and working toward that better world. We are managing the now, and we have a great deal of work to do to ensure that brighter future. So thank you again and take care.